Again, my name is Warren. I'm on the product team at Spring. Um, as a product manager, I'm actually not big on process. However, I do like structure and ownership because I think with structure and ownership, you can really drive productivity. And I think that you know having some organizational structure is really good. So that's what this talk is going to be about. I just want to also talk, uh, give thank you to Sean, Rowan, and uh, Taiga for piece, uh, piecing this whole thing together, Tiger especially, you kind of called this uh, out on the forum. I think now we're here, someone had to, had to get us here and, and, and make sure it happens. So appreciate the help. Uh, so the goal is pretty simple. Uh, we we want to agree on a flexible governance framework uh, for the Interledger project and create working groups uh, with actual check-ins. So I'll kind of unpack that a little bit. But we have, you know, our two-week, uh, our bi-weekly calls, which we want to actually kind of structure and, and, and talk about a little bit more. So the plans to kind of explore some of the concepts of gov governance. When you say governance, it kind of sounds like an official term. And, you know, it's, it, things are going to, everyone's going to start wearing suits and stuff. But that's actually not the case. Um, and we're going to look at some of the existing frameworks that, that work for some open source projects that we kind of called out that we think are relative to, to Interledger, those being Prometheus and Rust. Um, there's reasons why we chose those two. They're relatively new projects. Um, uh, Prometheus particularly spun out of Google. It had some organization already to it, which Interledger does. You know, I think it's, Interledger's pretty well organized now, but just maybe needs just a little bit more. Uh, we're gonna explore the current Interledger project structure. Just kind of break down the core project components and then finally, hopefully, agree on a flexible uh, framework and then uh, create the working groups. So kind of the concept of governance really evolves around decision making and structure. Decision making can, and by no means, I'm not an expert at this. I just kind of raise my hand. That's what happens when you, you raise your hand. Um, so there's the benevolent dictators. They're kind of the single decision makers. They have good intentions. Um, usually, most projects start off. There's a benevolent dictator who has, you know, um, <laughs> who has a, uh, a, a, a good intentions, but it's it's got to start somewhere. Uh, I think there's a few benevolent dictators in this room, um, and that's a good thing. We want those those people because their leaders are going to step up and they're going to help. Uh, organize things. Uh, then, you know, there's also lazy consensus where no vote really is like an, a, you're deferring to an agreement. So if you don't vote, you're kind of just default to agree, right? Um, there's a majority vote, which is, you know, 51%. Uh, there's the super majority vote, which is two thirds. And then there's a me member structure. There's the flat and the hierarchy. If It's a pretty simple concept. Uh, if you get a chance, definitely great to read the uh, the tyranny of structurallessness. Um, it's a really good, qu pretty quick read, but it's been cited a lot. Um, it kind of talks about a little bit like why a, a structureless environment is actually not that great for productivity. So to kind of show a little bit about Prometheus, who here is familiar with Prometheus? Okay. Um, so there's really kind of three types of uh, contributors for in Prometheus. There's the developer, and developer like anyone can propose a change. There's really no objection with uh, that you know within a reasonable amount of time. The decisions uh, it's considered it's kind of made. Um, if there are objections uh, and no consensus can be found, a vote may be called by a team member, which brings up the team members. So team members have kind of been around for a little while. Um, they've been ongoing contributing for about three months. Um, they usually have, you know, kind of a following. People kind of understand their style. Uh, people know like how, you know, they have like kind of been grouped with other team members. Um, and then new, new team members are actually proposed by existing members uh, by supermajority. And this is where things get a little like structured and I'm not really sure if, if that's going to be you know, fitting for, for this project. Then there's the maintainers. The maintainers are kind of like the owners, right? They're, uh, they're written, you know, they appear on a list in a MD file um, of a specific project. 
Um, and they actually have typically like merge access. So they can actually like, you know, actually merge different things. There, there's typically a few of them um, and they have like their own kind of consensus. What does release mean? Can release, can release the project? Merge code into like, you know, from in, into the project, right? So technical, there's kind of a d divide between technical decisions and like more community decisions. Uh, focus kind of here on the, com on the technical decisions. They're uh, basically made by the maintainers kind of informally. Most people just kind of like lazy consensus kind of agree with the maintainers and they kind of follow maintainers. Um, and then if there is like, it comes to a point where, you know, there does, there is some contention and consensus cannot be achieved. There, it kind of falls to a majority vote. And then if, and if it's like becomes really contentious and you can't get a majority vote, then it actually, are, it's like a really, really important uh, decision, then it will fall into like two thirds majority. So new projects uh, are usually proposed first, lazy consensus um, by an actual team member, um, and then they kind of move their way through, through the, the chain. Now I'm actually not that familiar with Rust. I'm not that familiar with Prometheus yet, <laughs> um, but uh, Evan can kind of talk more. But it's kind of similar to Prometheus, <clears throat> but they actually, the community specifies like actual guidelines through our, uh, for substantial changes through RFCs. Now I know, you know, Interledger already kind of supports RFC models, so I think this is like something that we could, you know, explore. Um, in Rust, each major decision in Rust starts as an RFC. Uh, people are invited to talk about it. Um, sometimes the, t the discussion takes a while and uh, community kind of de uh, deliberates on, on quality. Now, the RFCs are, are pretty popular, like obviously in the Ethereum development community. Um, you know, people can like, like call out an RFC, ERC and just everyone knows what, what you're talking about or the people that are in the project. So there's a lot of like common, common ground. So going over a little bit of the project structure for veterans, this is you know going to be pretty obvious, but for newcomers, maybe not so. Uh, so kind of breaking it down, you have your, your protocol specs, uh, the publication and documentation, which is housed on interledger.org. Uh, specs are also, you know, to some degree, and then I think there's kind of share of, of what GitHub and, and interledger. So we'll probably have to like decide on a place um, communications have been happening kind of more centralized on the forum in a forum.interledger.org. And then there's been our biweekly community calls and then events. Everybody's here. Um, and then now we have like actually multiple reference implementations, which this is actually why, you know, governance is going to come to, to a point right now because we have more projects, more people, things will inevitably start to break. Uh, so having some kind of formal, a little bit more formal organization to it. So, and this is kind of where I want to get a little more discussion oriented. Um, but we should kind of start to think about like, what are kind of the responsibilities? Uh, when we break like these four projects into working groups, is this seem like a pretty straightforward way to like, is there anything that should be added or merged or should we, is this how we should kind of structure things in terms of working groups? Like there's an actual protocol spec working group. There's a working group for publication and documentation, which is really kind of interledger.org. Um, there's a working group for communications. I mean, does this actually seem like it, it's pretty reasonable? I think working group's a good idea. I think we should probably I'm not sure if that's the right breakout of what they should be, but definitely, I, I totally support the working group idea. We've got support for working group. Sounds good. Progress. Um, so the question. <laughs> 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 yeah. Was that lazy consensus? That's, uh, <laughs> what was that? Lazy so, consensus. Um, so who else? Like, is there is there something else out there that besides working groups that 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 we think would be more effective? I don't know if it'd be more effective, but TC39 has the champion model, which is more interesting. So what they do is they designate a champion for um, a particular uh, project, um, and they're tasked to lead it together with other people. So it works a little bit different 
yeah, a working group. A working group may have an implied champion, but um, yeah. in the DC39 model, you've got an explicit champion. Yeah, um, would you mind if I uh, took the mic for uh, a bit and just talked about uh, TC39? Oh, yeah, yeah, the mic <laughs> Anyone else, too? Uh, this is, should be open for Okay, um, I've been on TC39 now for um, more than 10 years, I think 11. Um, uh, through most of that time, uh, representing Google, uh, now representing uh, my own startup, Agoric. Uh, TC39 has gone through some interesting phases. Uh, and altogether, it's worked out, um, both, both major phases have worked out very, very well. I'm very proud of the work we've done on TC39. And it has some rather bizarre lessons. Um, the lazy consensus is essentially the ultimate decision making we've been using for everything. Uh, we never, ever use majority vote or supermajority vote. Uh, but we define, so, so we talk about consensus, but we, we purposely do not define it precisely. So it's a little bit of a loose, co loose and adaptable concept. But here's the way I would explain what we mean by consensus. Um, if somebody, if, if you have basically an overwhelming um, uh, majority wanting to do uh, things a particular way and a weakly held objection, uh, the person that has the weakly held objection uh, generally yields because they don't feel strongly. Uh, a single person, we're now like 70, per, 70 people are attending TC39. That number is not, not precise. I don't know how many it is, but it's been growing tremendously. It's still the case that a single strongly held objection will block consensus. And that has saved us over and over and over again for making mistakes. Over and over again, we look back on something a year later and we think, my God, we're glad that somebody objected to that. We would have made this really terrible mistake and only one person appreciated that it was a mistake. Um, uh, going back to you know, when I first started, uh, ECMAScript 4 was something that had general committee consensus and Doug Crockford started out as the lone dissenter saying, this shall not be the standard. Uh, and over time, he, um, uh, he gathered, uh, like the Henry Fonda ca character in um, uh, 12 Angry Men, he sort of gathered more and more people to the uh, dissent on that. Um, uh, the uh, key thing about why that works is we all understand that that rule enables a bad faith blockage of a proposal, it can be bad faith because it's based on politics or based on something other than technical merit. And if that ever happens, then the process we've got is over. It will, it will die and we'll do something else and we'll all be much less happy. Uh, we're able to do this only because even as the committee's expanded tremendously both in organizations and people, everybody deals with each other in good faith, everybody argues things on technical merit. Um, the, now when I say about, so that's been the case over both phases. The early phase, which took us through ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 6, and when I say, um, uh, I started in uh, 2007, so I'm not speaking about anything that happened before that. The early phase, uh, the entire committee deliberated on everything. There was really no champions, there were no separate, in any official sense, there were no separate proposals. It was. Uh, everything was technical proposals for, the, for everybody in the committee to evaluate. The committee was much, much smaller, and the language was much less well-defined. It hadn't really settled yet. Uh, so we were able to take, by virtue of everybody participating in the entire language design, we were able to treat the language as an organic whole, and we could understand the complexity budget cost of every individual proposal. That lasted through ECMAScript 6. After ECMAScript 6, we adopted the proposal process uh, where we have separate proposals that go through four stages. The, the, the entrance criteria for each stage is very, very well defined and it's respected. We occasionally make exceptions because it's only in agreement with ourselves, but we're very aware that every exception sets a bad precedent. So we've really been keeping that, you know, that uh, very minimized. Um, the proposal process has led to consistently high quality and compatibility 
of the proposals by the time they get to be part of the language. Uh, it's, it's, um, and that's been working with a large number of contributors. The people, the champions, and the groups uh, oriented around each proposal become effectively a working group of, of, of the people interested in that proposal. And then it's um, uh, necessarily the case when it's ready to advance to another stage, it's brought before, before the committee as a whole. And otherwise, uh, as needed, uh, it's brought before the committee as a whole for a status update. Here's the progress we made. Here's what's changed since the last time we presented it. Um, the problem with the proposal process, and, and I want to make clear, despite the problem I'm about to explain, I think it's worth it. We needed the proposal process. But the problem is it obscures the overall cost and complexity budget to the language. Once you have these separate proposals with their separate working groups, to each working group, progress seems like advancing the proposal. And nobody appreciates rejection of a proposal, not because there was anything wrong with the proposal per se, but because its overall complexity cost to the language as a whole was too great. So as the language expands and things are focused on separately, we're losing sight of the overall complexity budget. And I think that um, I would caution anybody pursuing any effort like this where it's broken up into separate groups concerned with separate parts that you think ahead to how you're going to push back and reject things that are actually technically well formed because it doesn't pay for its weight. You're talking about your term complexity budget. How does that also mean uh, in regards to a proposal or an idea that uh, seems good in a silo but overall if there's not somebody looking from above that can decide that's gone off the reservation. That's, that's right. That's exactly the danger. And in the proposal process, as TC39 constructed it, there's no part of the process that's specifically designed to provide that feedback. Uh, the only mechanism by which the feedback is provided and, and by which the feedback genuinely is provided, it's still, it's still happening, is that for a proposal to advance to a stage, it has to be brought to a plenary session consisting of the committee as a whole. And um, the committee as a whole, I, I would have to say honestly, a small minority of the members in the committee as a whole are acting as guardians of the complexity of the overall language. That's enough. Um, so there's, there have been repeatedly proposals that have been stopped because the complexity budget doesn't, because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't carry its own weight. Um, but each one of those is a fight because you have a focus group of people seeing the benefit of the proposal they care about and without their, without feeling the cost to the complexity budget as, as a whole because that's not what they're, they're oriented around. So you have to have people who sort of take personal responsibility to be those guardians, and you have to have an expectation that when something fails the test of those guardians, that people give up even though the proposal taken by itself looks good. And, and if there's some better way to do this, better way to, to actually have a mechanism specifically focused on complexity budget, I'd love to hear it because I'd like to bring it to TC39. By the way, let me mention, uh, if you do a web search uh, for an essay that I wrote um, that's uh, it's, um, in the uh, ES Discuss archives, uh, an essay called uh, The Tragedy of the Common Lisp, or How Large Languages Explode. Um, and and I, think, I think I got it right, sort of what the, what the externality problem is that causes languages to explode once the complexity budget cost is no longer very visible. A couple of challenges that I would personally point to would be, I think for new people coming to the project, it's not always clear how to get involved. Uh, that's, that's one that I would like to see addressed. Um, another one on spec changes, I think this was really well illustrated by Sabine's challenges where she did a lot of work to put together this re these really awesome specs and then was faced with this question of who needs to approve them? How long do I need to wait for those people to respond? And sort of 
whose opinion matters, frankly? Like if one person says, I think it should be this way, should she change it? Should she not? Does it depend on who that person is? Does it, like, and and the bit I think a really big one was uh, she mentioned today was was really the timing issue of just if you know right I think to date there have been a, there the Interledger project kind of has a number of people that kind that hold informal veto power over most things and so that's a question of like do we want to keep that do we want to formalize that and then also like. If some of those people that have traditionally had informal veto power like don't respond for weeks and weeks and weeks, have they give it? You know, sh should you just merge it? Um, so I think that that's another another challenge. Um, and another thing I'll point to is um, I think that Interledger JS right now has a bit of a governance or maintenance problem because it's not clear who the maintainers of that are. So for example. Um, what is the project roadmap for Interledger JS? What is Interledger JS trying to be? Um, there have been some specific issues brought up, like should there be a mono, should there be a move to a mono repo? Who decides that kind of thing, and who would actually implement that is one question. And then, when people have issues with it, who, whose responsibility is it to respond? And I think, if, I think making more explicit some of the sort of rights and responsibilities of maintainers of different projects would make it clearer like who who needs to step up to to take on issues that come up those are a couple of things that have come up somewhat recently i'm curious if anybody else has other challenges that they would point to that we could try to think about in this session i guess not necessarily related to this one um, but like high level in my experience working with different communities and i did a lot of public relations for different companies um, I think one thing that worked really well for Meteor in particular since early days uh, was having a monthly uh, meetup. So one thing that worked really well is having a very steady schedule of once a month event in San Francisco. It was called a dev shop and the format was usually very simple. There was a main talk, sometimes two, and there was a series of lightning talks where people could um, demo their projects and show what they're working on and solicit feedback and just like, have this like, support group of people working on the same thing. Um, and they were also recorded, so people could then post those materials as demos for the sort of like future advancing of those projects, and that created this like nice reaction of other cities seeing those videos and seeing that event, which when I was living in Toronto and Vancouver and like traveling around Pacific Northwest, I saw that format and I just started giving talks in other places. So I think that could create this like chain reaction of people hosting similar events around the world. Um, but the thing I think that, that was critical was Every single month, there was this one event in San Francisco that like made this like steady beat of things happening, which I think you were doing previously in Boston, uh, and I think having like a space and a place for people to get together and demo things um, in San Francisco or some like that that would be pretty awesome. And I'd be very happy to help uh, run it and be the person so like either emceeing or d giving some talks on that. That's awesome. So I, I will just put forth like if there are people that want to step up and, t and take responsibility for any any one of the things that come up here, that is it was really really great and kind of what's needed in order to make any one of these projects happen. So let's definitely put that on the on the list. Add, I think it's incredibly important for any of the content created that we do videos. Like we're videoing this. Some of the uh, meetups, there's been audio recording previously, but not for all. Right? Like I think that stopped at some point. But I actually hear people coming to us saying, like, how do I learn more? How do I get involved if I missed one of the community calls, for example? It's not always a, a safe, known place to go. There are, the, the, there are recordings. I, I have to manually link to them on the side. Of the yeah. So I have to catch up on the back. But uh, I, 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 I put, based on your point, that we definitely need to make it easier for a distributor. Like make stuff available. If you want to host a meetup, like where do you even start? What do you do? Like, do you need, like we like we've had so many requests along like the years of people like asking for permission to host a meetup. Like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> On the last thing you said, um, is there anyone that would be interested in helping Adrian out to make sure that recordings of community calls? go up in a timely manner. I'm, I'm being serious about that just because like, I think one, one of the issues is like, if there's one person who's tasked with, with something, it may slip behind other priorities. But if there's like a little, if there's some other people that are all like together working on making sure that that goes up every time. This is where I think the working format 
would work. So I, uh, my proposal would be that we have kind of operational working groups, but then, or a working group, I mean, we don't need to go to the top, but then uh, working groups in the sense of what we were talking about at TC39 or others that are focused on like uh, protocol advancement are slightly different. It's like, I want to work on something to do with the protocol, let's get a bunch of people of common mind to work on that together. It's different to, let's be responsible for maintaining the website. But that's a different type of thing. Um, and I, I, I think the answer to solving some of that stuff is working groups. So like, a group of three, five, whatever people that say, we'll earn like collateral, we'll maintain the website, whenever stuff happens, we'll post up links, we'll do whatever, that would be, you know, write blog posts, that would be awesome. I will volunteer to make it one of Adrian's OKR stuff, but they call us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, working <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say that I like the idea of working groups. I've been participating at IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, and I think since Interledger Protocol has parallels with Internet Protocol, um, it's a very good structure, like we can follow it completely. I like the idea of working groups, how um, um, I didn't like the idea of splitting the working groups as it was on the slides, but it should be, as you mentioned, like focused on one particular part of the interledger protocol. Like this is the routing group, it has a charter, this is our focus. Um, if you want to propose something, uh, propose it as a draft and all the people participating in there will decide if that working group is interested in working on that part. Um, it could be anything, it could be something new related to the routing protocol or some improvement, some small improvement, whatever. And then there can be rough consensus on how uh, things will progress and um, obviously implementation is one big part of IETF, like rough consensus and running code is how IETF runs. Um, and uh, I, I guess I, that works very well for me. Like I have been participating at IETF and it's been very good experience. Um, nobody has, um, as far as I understood from your talk, everyone in the working group has a veto bar. Like every, has a veto like to say oh, no. No it's, 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 no, it's much bigger than that. Everybody on the committee has effectively a veto but with strong social feedback not to use your veto lightly. Um, okay. um, so that's on the committee as a whole. When, when, the, when the working group is ready for stage advancement, they bring it to the committee as a whole, and a single strongly held objection by the committee as a whole uh, is enough to stop things. But if everyone but one dissenter wants to see it advance, uh, the dissenter feels strong social pressure uh, and the dissenter uh, ha is certainly called on to explain very well the nature of their objections uh, and to engage with counterargument. So, so when you're in that situation, you're you're very much half you know, you're very visibly arguing your dissent on technical merits, and nobody sustains a veto if they're not arguing their dissent on technical merits. Yeah, that doesn't happen at ITF. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I like that idea and splitting of working groups is a good idea. On the current proposal process, uh, I mean, we, we, had a, we had a need at one point to document it. So we started with the white paper, right? That, that Stefan and Evan published this white paper. And then things have evolved and we needed to start capturing more and more pieces of the spec that, in a way, that allow people to go away and write interoperable implementations. So very much modeled on the ITF mm -hmm. model. Um, what we were constantly balancing, or have been constantly balancing, is making the process too heavy um, so that it's difficult for people to participate versus too light that uh, we had a challenge along the way where people were working on code, especially you know, David and I worked on a job implementation at, at one point, and we were just not progressing as fast as the other implementations and the specs were effectively catching up to the other implementations. So the ground was constantly moving under our feet. So we, we were trying to balance those two. And I think what we have the advantage of now is that a lot of the core protocols, as Evan points out, are pretty solidified. And so we can put those up as, this is the protocol specs. And I think what the RFC process should be now is along the TC39 proposal sort of concept of, I want to propose something new, here's a proposal. And it shouldn't be 
like in Sabine's case, here's a pull request against something existing, it's just here's a proposal, it's something completely new and by default it's visible for everyone to see, review, comment on, and if that impact is that a pre-existing thing needs to change, then that the outcome of everyone agreeing to the proposal is that thing changes. And I think that's roughly how IETF works today. So you, you go look at an old draft and it'll link you to, well, this has been superseded now by X. And so, so we have introduced a kind of an idea of you have RFC numbers, but each RFC also has a draft number. So the intent there is that if it radically changes, it gets deprecated and it gets a new RFC number. If it's just editorial tweaks and changes, it's just a new draft number on the same thing. That, that, that's that's the, the, the way the structure is intended. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it works now. So in the example of the pool payments, we probably should have merged three or four times during the process to say, like, this is now draft six, draft seven, draft, or in fact, just had a parallel stream of work was proposal for pool payments. And standalone, we work through that, and it's it's not this unwieldy pull request; it's a proposal. It sounds like some, this sort of RFC process seems like something that could use a little bit of a, of a review. Yeah. And I would say another piece that I think that I would find helpful would be um, some kind of actually never mind, um, some kind of template for what we expect in the RFCs, because um, a lot of our RFCs have different sections. And I think when you're writing one, it's, it's very helpful to have, like, what do we expect you to have in there? Um, can I just add, I, like, I want to caution against this idea of working groups, because already it's like, I think it's adding more structure to a already very unstructured setting. And maybe it's going like too far into structure, in the sense that everybody's going to be fired up here, and everybody goes home, and then it's, it's like trying to keep that process going and like I think adding too much complexity on initially. Like that complexity should grow out of a necessity, not out of a need to say, oh, we should have structure, let's put it really structured. Like, I, I agree. So that, that's why I think um, to me, I'm framing it in terms of like there's some specific challenges that, that I think we've seen emerge. Some of these issues seem like the, the issue is with a lack of clarity around who is respond like who's responsible for certain pieces and what, what do those responsibilities entail. And I don't think we're going to answer all of that now, but I would love to try to identify some groups of people maybe that are, that are you know, have been involved in the project for a long time, maybe other people who are interested in getting involved in specific aspects of these. And we could think about <clears throat> identifying groups of people who are interested in like, if the RFC process is something that could use a review, like who's actually going to do that review? And then can we check in with you in two weeks time or three weeks time, something like that to see how it's gone? Like so, something along those lines seems like it'd be useful to, to me. Yeah, so um, uh, if, speaking again about PC39 experience, JavaScript through ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 6 really was, um, an overall architecture where there was a lot of cross-cutting concerns. In general language design and protocol design, there's a lot of cross-cutting concerns. In order to make an adjustment at one place in, in either kind of architecture, you often find yourself needing to make an, a, an adjustment somewhere else in the architecture. Um, the proposal process, if we had started it in that phase, it would not have worked. Uh, the proposal process is not adapted well to dealing with cross-cutting concerns, to dealing with the system as a whole as an organic, um, holistic uh, design effort. Uh, after ECMAScript 6, the, architect the, the overall architecture of language was pretty much settled to where many issues could be dealt with separately. We still have issues that cannot be dealt with separately, and frankly, we fight the proposal process when we come across those. The proposal process interferes with us dealing with those uh, well. So the, the degree to which um, uh, you guys are ready for a proposal process versus continuing as you are really depends on how settled things are such that these issues don't have lots of cross-cutting concerns. Well, I think the, the, um, the you know, not having too many cross-cutting concerns puts a, a um, lower bound on when you can introduce a working group process. <laughs> um, and what I think puts the upper bound on is like when the complexity exceeds what a single group can do. And so I think, I think we've, we've reached a point, in my opinion, 
um, where we have eliminated enough cross-cutting concerns that we could work on things like stream and routing separately, um, but I don't know if we've reached a point where we have to work on them separately. Just to respond to that specific point, in terms of like whether we split it up on things like stream and routing separately, I don't feel that strongly on that. To me, it feels a little bit like the group that tends to review poll, um, RFCs is small enough and we have f relatively few new ones coming in that that to me could be the same to, su to some extent. Like I'm probably going to weigh in less on a routing specific thing where you, where you would probably weigh in more. Um, but I think it would be helpful if somebody wants to propose something to know who, who are the reviewers for, for those types of things. Um, so that, that's why to me it seems like bucketing all specs, specs together, together might make sense. sense. Whereas like it would be useful to know like who's in charge of Interledger JS. Like the, the decision for the mono repo thing is just I think one example of the type of decision that, that needs to be made. Like who, whose decision is that to make? Um, and if, it, if the project is going to be worked on by representatives of different companies, um, like how, how are they working together and is there someone that's in charge of it? How, do, how does that work? When there's bugs, who's going to make sure that, that they're fixed in a timely manner? Um, th things like that. So I, I could see those being... That, that, that would be one, one proposal. proposal. Would be to separate sort of spec and protocol, protocol design as, as like one category of stuff. Um, and then impl like each implementation um, could have its own, own sort of thing. Um, it would be nice to have, I think, project roadmaps for each of the implementations. Like what, are, what is going to be added in the next bunch of time? Sort of who's, who's going to be working on those things and, and come to some agreement on that? Also so that new people know how to plug in. That would be one thing. Um, the website is a common complaint that documentation on the website or sort of the tutorials are out of date. So it would be really good if there's people that feel really strongly about making sure that new developers that come to this ecosystem have a good experience with what the docs that we have. Um, it would be really good to have people that are, that are clearly in charge of like setting the sort of roadmap for the website. Um, just a minor point, um, but when we talk about the implementations, I think uh, IntelliJS is part of um, the JS Foundation and um, Hyperledger Quilt is part of the Hyperledger project. And so there are some constraints in terms of like what projects that are part of these foundations can do and decide. And, um, and what processes they should use is sometimes uh, restricted. I, I think I would go one further and say the implementation projects are implementations. So, you know, IETF is responsible for HTTP, but they don't tell Nginx or Apache or any of them sure. how to do. So I think we should treat the implementation projects are basically owned by the people who maintain that code. And I think we need to think of Interledger as the project that maintains the specs, maintains the website, tries to look after the community, and to some extent has reference implementations, but those are reference in as much as they're useful for people to look at as a way of understanding the protocol. And if they're not that anymore, if they're you know, used because people are running them, then the community that owns that should own it because they have you know, an interest in keeping that code running, not using it as an example or implementation. Maybe, there's a, maybe part of the solution to the Interledger JS thing is to say, what's the identity of Interledger JS? Is it just a reference implementation? Or is it being built for, uh, you know, is it a product that somebody is taking to make like onboarding you know, easy. It, it, I guess it's a, it's a little bit unclear at the moment what Interledger JS's purpose is in the world. Um, and, and I think that's up to maintainers of that code base to decide. There's a separate question about how do we maintain the specs, how do we maintain the community documentation and that stuff. I think the web's got a good, is a good example. Like you have, you know, Chrome, you have, you know, Firefox and so on. As a community, they've almost picked Mozilla as the, uh, as the, the company that's going to provide the documentation for the whole web community. So Mozilla developer documentation, you know, Google contributes to those as an example. So, so we can have you know, general developer kind of documentation like the tutorials on the website and everyone who's building implementations and so on can help contribute to those. But then run your own process about how you want to manage your implementation is my opinion.
just to push back on that a little bit, like I don't think we need to dictate a process, but I think there, or like a governance structure, but I think there there should be one. And like to get really specific, um, there is no one at Ripple working on the Interledger JS anymore. Um, it is unclear to me whether that is more owned by Coil, Kava, or other. Um, there's a ton of issues that come in through the Gitter channel. Not that many people are respo that responsive to that. Um, and there's no, there's no roadmap for like where that project is going. So it feels like that I would call that an interledger JS problem as opposed to an interledger problem, unless the interledger community says interledger JS is our reference implementation and it's all of our responsibilities to maintain. Right now it is the only fully working implementation. So if that doesn't work, Everyone's experience of the Interledger protocol is bad. Um, so I think there's a very high priority that that project work well. Um, and well, a thought on that is it's an opportunity for other implementations to do better. But, but <laughs> like, <laughs> as somebody working on another implementation, like, sure, I want to try to do better, but like, that's not. Like there's some delta there in terms of like people are having a bad experience today and for the last number of months coming to the Interledger project and like money D doesn't work. The test net doesn't work. Um, like this is a really, this, I think this is a very, very serious problem for this whole ecosystem. Um, and I think it's, a, it, I think we sh it would be worthwhile to have like some more. And that, I mean, and that's, for, for me, that's speech. another challenge is we're talking about three dimensions. There's protocol specs, there's implementations, and there's the existence and availability of a network. There's all different things that are somewhat related, but I can have working code, but the test net's down. Terrible first time experience. But I can have good. working code, a working test net, but when, if I want to find any documentation about how it works, I can't. Like those are interrelated, but also, you know, there's a, there's a whole different process to keeping a live test network versus managing a roadmap for implementation versus you know the standards process which is slow and you know tedious and much more sort of consensus and driven. Just, I, I totally agree and I think like what I would what I would personally argue for is not necessarily like, standardized processes across these just clear ownership as yeah. kind of as Warren cool. alluded to like like who owns the test net there should be some group of people that are like we will make sure the test net is always up and like we will work together to make sure that that but that feels like a a project that like so somebody, I, I think somebody a, should a have a concrete proposal on that would be by the end of today let's have a bunch of people companies who put their hands up and say i will commit to running a testnet connector that i keep alive and i keep online and if there's at least 3 of those like if one goes down, you two out of three up. The, the network is live. The nature one. of the protocol. There we awesome. Go. <laughs> Taking responsibility. We got, we got two more over there. Oh, four. Yeah, All right. So that's cool. So, so that's very productive session. Okay. <laughs> All right. We got to take some names so that these people don't hold on. Yeah. So public accountability. Yeah. So uh, Ripple definitely is going to run one. Um, Not me. <laughs> I, yeah. Somebody's going to run one. Can we, like those people, can we gather after this? So yeah, so yeah. That, that okay. is, can somebody sit, or we'll, we'll try to gather, gather up folks that are, that are interested in being part of the test net, but that seems like a very useful. So this um, is for a test net connector. Test net connectors. Uh, we have Ripple, we have Coil. <laughs> I just volunteered you guys. Strata. Secure blockchains. Uh, Flare. Flare Akash. network. Akash. Gatehub. Gatehub. Strata, and you guys, of course. Anybody else? Solstice. Okay, we've got, that's, I like it. Stefan raises an interesting point, and I'd be interested to hear what this thing is. Perhaps the more, the potentially more successful way of solving this in the long term is making it easier for people to run connectors live yeah, this is part of also like the ILP experience, like presentation I was going to give. We got a dog food. Like we have to run these things ourselves to like feel the the hurt and like yeah. fix it. So I think so running. So is, is, if there's a real financial cost to getting onto the internet, I feel like that's a bit of a hurdle. But if we can make it easy, then that's a win. 
getting on the internet here and saying, hey, I'm on, I'm running a connector, and receiving first, maybe, um, as a way of sort of feeling comfortable without losing money. I, I, I don't know. know. So, so just, just alternative, alternative, you know, route we could pursue or explore. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I think about it is, is if I want to make an application for the internet, I don't need to connect to a special internet or whatever. To test it. I think the main the main difference is we're dealing with money, and so there's potentially greater risk. But the way IntelliJ is architected is efficient enough to do your tests with such a small amount of money that you don't care about it. it, it regardless, like if your total income is like a dollar a day, you can still afford to test with you know a thousand micro dollars, you know. And so um, what I would want to see is like just ultra easy on ramp um, to the to the live network and. You know, we could probably brainstorm at Coil a little bit, like what that would look like, and um, maybe offer that for free potentially. So, yeah, we can see what we can do. Um, I was going to say, I feel like it's uh, premature to start drawing too many parallels between us and the web, just because the scales are totally disparate. And you know, there's what four billion people on the web, and everyone on ILP is more or less in this room, and so. Uh, <laughs> Like it's it, we can achieve consensus much faster than like you know TC39 and like uh, we are able to move faster and we have to move faster and so separating the idea of like an adoption working group from like a reference implementation for example I think isn't necessarily a distinction that needs to be made right now like you can just say that there's this one group and maybe there's like a representative from each company you're responsible for making sure that like people who are trying to adopt this technology don't have a bad experience, and that means a working test net, and that means good documentation, and that means the website doesn't go down, and that means that there's like a Docker container ready to go for you to just throw up somewhere and try it out. Uh, and you know, and then that would also be the group maintaining like the, the JS implementation, and then down the road, you know, maybe you say, okay, well, all of these implementations are like all the different web servers, and people can just run whatever they want. All we maintain is the standard right now, but because there isn't just like a thing that just is like, here's the canonical implementation. Everyone should try to emulate this. You know, that's that's kind of the, you know, the the end goal, and so that needs to be swept up and all in the same group. So I, th I think all of those concerns are so closely related that you just need like a core group of people who are like, it's our responsibility to make sure that newcomers have a good time. We did have this conversation two years ago when I first started the job implementation. And basically, the outcome of that was, let's just get one good implementation for people, people to use. use. And one day, someone will come along and say, this isn't fast enough for me. I'll write a different one. And that's what's happened. Um, but I think part of the problem is that one implementation has had some challenges as well. Like the, the settlement discussion we had today, I think that was a big blocker for you know, people getting on board. So that's the one disadvantage of a canonical implementation is any fault it has basically faults with the whole project then. Like that permeates through the whole project. So there's an element of implementations are a way for people to go out and try and fix stuff that they disagree with in the reference. Um, Otherwise, we have to design the reference implementation by committee. So I, I, I agree with you. We don't want to prematurely add too much process, which I think is what Matt was saying as well. But at the same time, I want to differentiate between implementations and like community stuff, like documentation and specs and so on. That, that I think we as a group here today can make an effort to solving. But implementations, let people go off and explore. The only risk is that two people build implementations of something new, and those are not interoperable. And that's where you would hope we have a process that makes it easy for them to come back and say, hey, I like, built this thing that does pull payments. Someone's like, oh, I also did that. Like, let's find a way for those to be similar. Like, like our design of settlement infrastructure today. I think that's useful. If, if we had spent another six months building Rafiki and Evan building Interledger RS, and our implementations were completely different, it would have been quite difficult to come back and unify that settlement interface. So, so I'm hoping that the proposal process would be maybe something how we do that. Maybe we should test like proposing that interface as a, you know, some, some lightweight process that we take that through as a way to test that idea and get feedback from people on that. It, 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 I already feel like the RFC process is too heavy for that. I, so I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't know about if I, if I want to do that. I think the, 
the things that, uh, another thing that I was thinking about while you, we were mentioning was like, one thing where the implementations are part of the project as a whole is like whether the website has documentation about the implementations or links to them. Um, that may, I think makes it, makes the implementations more a part of the project as a whole versus if it didn't, like, and that's a split that I'm, I'm not sure like how we should how we should go on that, but like I think there is an interesting question of um, at what point would the Java like docs for the Java implementation or the Rust implementation, if ever, be added to interledger.org, and or should interledger JS docs like not be on interledger.org, should they be taken off of there and put somewhere else? And then should the website, like what should the website tell you about the implementations you might want to use? And, and that's where I think we're at a bit of an inflection point because previously you would have said, if you want to see an implementation, go here. Now we can say, if you want to see an implementation, like this guy's building one in Java, this guy's got one in Rust, like this is, and, and then it's up to the projects to talk about what they've implemented, what they haven't, what works, what doesn't. I mean, it's in your interest if you're building an implementation to make it work with everyone else. So if, if any implementation goes off on their own path and like tries to build stuff that's non-interoperable, they, they effectively fork themselves out of the community. So I, I, like I, don't, I don't think we have such an issue with the, the interoperability piece. Like I think there's enough incentive to make the implementation interoperable, but I think there, there is an opportunity to have some kind of like best, best practices or something for, um, and, and try to define a little bit like who, who works on these things. Uh, I don't think specs, um should be of uh, any programming language specific. They are a general structure of what a protocol is, right? So if it is interledger.js or RS, that should not be a part of the standard document or RFC or whatever it is. If, if someone is implementing .js, that their documentation is on the GitHub or on their website, that's good. Those are the, I mean, we should separate standards from uh, implementation specific details. And as far as uh, interoperability is concerned, the way IATF handles it is they organize hackathons where people can come and um, check their implementations against each other. And if they find some common bugs or some things to improve, uh, they'll propose it for the uh, standards, and then that can be implicated in that. I don't think we should include .js implementation in the spec or .rs implementation in the spec. That doesn't make sense at all, to me at least. Yeah, so they're mostly not included in this mostly. There's one thing where it is included in the specs, and Adrian hates that the most. Um, but I think the, the, web, the website is, I, could be seen as slightly different than the, the specs themselves, um, or not. Like the, the website could be either the place that you go to find all the information about how to use Interledger, or it could be only the place that talks about the protocol as a whole, links to the specs and sort of community stuff, and then maybe provides links out to the individual projects, and they are just completely separate. Speaking again about the uh, TC39 uh, experience, uh, first of all, um, uh, we do have exactly the kind of separation of specification from implementation that you're talking about uh, in the sense that uh, TC39 only, considers, only concerns itself with spec language and uh, they only consider observable differences or differences that are, are salient. Um, and then we have, uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, four competing companies creating four competing implementations, uh, all of which are cooperating to make sure they're interoperable. However, I, uh, the reason I took the microphone is there's one exception to this. There's one form of code that TC39 itself manages, and that is the test suite. Test 262 is an extensive test suite where the rule is that the tests in the test suite can only test things that are normative implications of the spec. Same as the case with IETF. They have test suites and the RFCs, which all the implementations yeah. should. That's the minimum um, Excellent. to achieve. Yeah. One thing you said that made me think uh, would be a really great idea, and I don't know if others would be interested in doing this, is we meet twice, twice a week to talk. 
but maybe occasionally, and I know it's a fairly distributed community, we should have sessions where we all dial into a video conference just for a couple of hours, and it's sort of ad hoc, come and go as you please, but in an effort to just test interoperability of stuff. So, hey, I'm working on something, uh, you know, let's see if we can connect, let's see if we can send some packets, let's try stuff out. Um, and maybe that forgoes the need for a test net for at least implementers. Um, I don't know. It, it, it was I thought of it just as you were speaking, and if people are interested in doing that, maybe we can try a few and see how they go. Test suite is definitely a priority. We need a test suite working group. One thing I'd say I think has been a blocker on the test suite is uh, bilateral protocol. So like I think we were starting to write some performance tests, for example, using BTP, and then everyone sort of started going, well, actually maybe HTTP is better. I think if we just we pick one, uh, that's kind of the, the standard for at least testing, that, that's probably a good start. I would definitely vote HTTP because it's going to be simpler, uh, and then we go from there. Yeah, I just wanted to extend the uh, discussion about a test net after this um, to a little bit more. I think Stefan made a really good point about the fact that you can just like run tests on the mainnet very easily at low to no cost. And I think it's an opportunity for us to just get mainnet nodes running. But I think there's like also a few key components that are like 70% of the way there. And those would be like a client interface, money D, like perhaps a visual version of that too, uh, like a GUI. And also kind of like, I started working on just like this easy connector bundle, but something that makes a connector really easy to configure and deploy for the people that are actually running those nodes on the live network. Um, so yeah, just like add a little bit more responsibilities to kind of like other than just running a testnet node, because I think if there was that many people willing to spin up a testnet node, like we can allocate those efforts uh, to more things too. I would say peering is pretty important too. Um, right now, like the shoot in the dark, random, get a connector, and if they're offline and have a bad time, it's just like not a great way to onboard people into the network. And so like testnet, like we need to define what it means to be on the testnet and then how we're going to get new users into the testnet in a way that is like useful. Either if that means sort of a dynamic list, it's like if you're not meeting a certain spec, you're not on the testnet list anymore because when people connect to you, they have a bad time, or just some sort of like way to do rotating peering so that people don't get stuck on in bad positions. I would just also emphasize like I, I think peering is actually peering or sort of some kind of auto peering function is something that there's been a number of disparate conversations about, and I think that would be a useful conversation to as a, have as a group a little bit like. Um, what should the peering process be? And that is definitely a cross-cutting project. Somebody should propose a way that that works and that gives us something to discuss. Yeah. I, think we've had, I think we've had a lot of discussion around the, uh, the, the peering. And two of the main ones have been like using either a gossip protocol, which would be like more decentralized. But there's also like an approach that's more trivial to get things started. And it's just like a hosted list somewhere. And like also if the connectors are dynamically configured, like the JavaScript, sorry, JavaScript one now is, or the Rust one, like something like a centralized list would be pretty easy. You just like get a host name from there and then ask the connect, you send your credentials to a connector from that list and say like, hey, can I get peering information? And then they can just add a plugin for you and you can add a plugin for them. And that, yeah, and that's quite Probably simple. You need a TXT record and a DNS. What was that? Possibly a DNS TXT record. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One thing that could be useful for the test net is that right now it sort of is used to test applications on ILP and you could use it to test new settlement methods and stuff. You could, there could be a test net that you could hook into, maybe even just one connector that doesn't do any settlement at all that you can just peer to it and send packets freely to anybody. And then that eliminates a whole dimension of stuff that can fail when, you're, when you just want to develop like an application on top of ILP. Are there people who are expected to act as red team against the test net for the kind of security claims that all of the software is trying to make, both, the, both in specification and in implementation? Uh, it's very, very important to have dedicated red team people trying to break things, and testnet is the ideal time for them to break things. Uh, it's really, it would be really unfortunate to go from testnet to mainnet 
without having subject the test net to an intense red team attack. Just to add to it, um, I mean, um, the documents or the specifications can also have um, section um, security considerations or something like that, um, where um, non-security experts could be um, informed about the, uh, the about the implications of whatever specs say, like clearly state that this is not intended uh, to secure against blah or something like that, yeah. Uh, we, we would be happy to participate as part of the red team. Uh, we're currently doing this for our own network and uh, so we would be happy to uh, contribute for that. And uh, as well, um, I personally would be happy to uh, participate in uh, helping with the documentation uh, for, for, for the website and various other uh, aspects as uh, anywhere um, that's helpful. And um, one thing that I find particularly uh, useful for uh, analyzing uh, protocols is like interactive content. Uh, one really great uh, uh, website that does this is called distill.pub and it's, uh, by op it's led by OpenAI and it's a machine learning based um, um, interactive content but I find it very helpful to uh, consume that when I try to understand uh, different protocols and I'd be happy to um, you know work on contributing these types of interactive content for the website and uh, and also um, I'd be happy to uh, 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 lead the, the UK uh, interledger meetups. Are there other people that want to uh, volunteer for, um, put themselves forward for? I mean, I can throw up. I was going to throw all the connectors. So, so what's going to come out of this if you put your name and I have access. I'm going to be able to help you. We have a real cool name. Just send an email to everyone. Right. Send their keys to help. But I can have. And we'll figure out what help means. I mean, my keys 24 hours. Cool. And so if you put your name here and then email you and you ignore that email, I can keep a test net. Several tests. I actually think these groups should should try to meet while they're here in, in person and discuss a little bit about like what what the specific projects are that need working on, um, or like. I think for the, the documentation, a really clear first step is reviewing the state of the current documentation, like when a newcomer comes to the Interledger docs, what do they find? And then coming up with some kind of plan for what, it what the experience should be, and then kind of assigning responsibility, like taking responsibility for who's going to actually make those changes. So let's be clear what's in the website and what's in the documentation. Okay. Uh, is documentation including specs? Or is it like tutorials and... I think you would want to separate like anything that's not normative. So like yeah. anything yeah. secondary documentation. Okay, okay. so okay. That, that's what this is. This is writing tutorials, explainers, people who feel like writing blog posts, whatever. Um, give me your name. So you can put one thing I like to include in documentation too is like we were talking earlier about how to present different implementations on the website and whatnot. Um, I think one thing that's always very hard for a newcomer is if you say like, hey, you're four implementations, go pick one. It's like, I don't know how to pick one. Like, you tell me which one's the best one. I'll start with that one, you know? So I think part of the documentation teams or working groups responsibility should be to actually make some opinionated recommendations in terms of like, here's where you should start. This is the easiest one to get started with. And then we can have that internal battle of like, oh, my implementation should be the recommended one or whatever, but don't put that on a newcomer. I think that's something I see implicitly said earlier, jokingly, and that is, this is an open community. If you want to write a blog post and talk about ILP, LP, positive, negative implementations, positive, negative, it's totally up, like, go for it. You know, this is, uh, you don't need to be sanctioned. If you want to start a meetup, you want to do anything, feel free. Um, I think this group will be more kind of controlled, the website, because it's going to exist under the interledger.org, you know, domain, and it's going to, you know, it, it, it we'll probably be more careful about what goes up there. Documentation could also include you writing your own personal blog post or tutorial. Um, you just want to contribute and be part of a group that are communicating about what they're doing so you don't both go off and two people don't go off and do the same thing. Fair. Okay. So I've got Flare, Secure Blockchains, Crypto Cowboy, Taiga. So I'd like to, to mention something about the content of the normative specification. Uh, many normative specifications say what should happen. 
uh, for something that has security properties, for something that's about its security properties, it's very important for the normative specification to be very clear about what must not happen by any means. Uh, to, have, to, to document the threat models and to say that within those threat models, uh, these invariants must not be able to be violated. Uh, and then the, the task of a red team or a bug bounty is very clear, which is uh, anyone who can cause any of the things that should not happen to happen uh, has found a, 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 at least a bug and possibly a vulnerability. Let's draw this of session officially to a close. If there are people that are, that are interested in any of these, like volunteering for specific things, maybe come on up to the board and then let's try to have some, some more conversation about this in the break. Yeah, one last group I would propose is uh, just open network usability. Like a group just solely dedicated to building out the tooling to the open network and making it easier for the open network to grow. Yeah, in that vein, I was going to see if people would want to see a um, connector status list. Okay. So let's let's break. Um, let's do a let's do a 15 minute break. Yeah. And then we're gonna come back and do two demos, and then Stefan's gonna have the.